Okay, so how many of you have ever even heard of the Arizona Technology Access Program of ASAP? Just a show of hands, call out, whatever you're able to do. Not a single person in the room. Oh, okay, I missed. Okay, all right, good. And did, did you have some service from us or someone told you about us or? Came to this meeting? Oh. <laughs> Today was the first time you've heard about it. Okay, I meant prior to this meeting, but all right, so. Um, okay, well, the, the objectives today are pretty straightforward. Um, my, my main goal is that you get a good understanding of ASTAP and what we do, what kind of direct services we offer. So we're going to go through a, 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 a listing of all our services, talk about our program, give you a good solid foundation of who we are, what we do, who we work with. Then um, Mike, Cecilia, and I have brought a wide variety of um, different types of assistive technology that are commonly used by folks with Parkinson's. And as you all know, the, the range of challenges is really broad with Parkinson's from obviously physical mobility to speech communication. Uh, you know, there's lots of, lots of different challenges. So we brought uh, items that kind of cover the major challenges that people come to us for with daily living and daily tasks. So we have lots of different kinds of assistive technology that I'm gonna go through with you today and then at the end of my presentation, if anyone's interested, they could come up and take a closer look at them and work with one of us on, you know, understanding their features, trying them out, getting a better sense of how they work. So a little bit of a hands-on opportunity uh, with some different types of assistive technology. So with that, those are my two main objectives today, access to AT and that you learn about our program and our services. All right, let me minimize that. Lost my PowerPoint here. There it is. All right. So I like to start off with some basic facts about ASTAP, kind of who we are, um, you know, where we exist, those kinds of things. We're actually a program with Northern Arizona University, and we're part of the Institute for Human Development up on campus. Well, a lot of people here were within AU and they think we're in Flagstaff, and that's not the case. Our main office and our, our main program is based in Phoenix. So we serve the whole state out of our main Phoenix office. As a program, we began or were officially launched in 1994. So we haven't been around a terribly long period of time. Uh, we're coming up on, on 30 years here pretty soon of being in existence as a program. We've evolved tremendously over the last 30 years, particularly the last 16 years um, that I've been with the program. Uh, we've added different uh, types of services and programs to what we do uh, for, for persons with disabilities in the community. So we've evolved tremendously over the last 27 plus years. We operate under the Assistive Technology Act. That's where we receive our federal funding uh, through. Uh, the federal funds flow through NAU, and then we exist down in Phoenix. It's just basically how it works. And we're known as what's called Arizona's kind of Tech Act project since we're funded by the Assistive Technology Act. They call us the Tech Act project. So we are one of actually 56 programs throughout the United States and uh, the territories like Guam, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. They all have their own programs. So we're just one uh, of 56 programs. There's one of us in every state, but we exist in different places in state government. Some states, their, their technology access program, like us, are a nonprofit organization. Some exist in the university system, like we do, and others um, are part of the uh, vocational rehabilitation agency in that state. So we exist in different places, but we're all federally mandated to do similar services. Everybody adds different things to their programs that are a fit for their state, but we're all federally mandated to do the core things that I'm going to cover with you today. So I'm hoping that gives you kind of a foundation of who we are and, and what we do. All right. So um, outside of Mike, Cecilia, and I, uh, these are our other staff. We have Carla, who's our other assistive technology specialist. She's Mike's counterpart, more or less. And we have Nicole, who's an occupational therapist that is up on campus and does some part-time work for us, but is still kind of unofficially part of our program. And uh, we launched an adaptive uh, gaming clinic in July of this year for people with disabilities who need assistance with playing video games and, and 
uh, adaptive equipment uh, related to that. And Lauren is our clinical coordinator uh, for that program. So perfect. So right now we're actually down a couple of positions and we're in a process of, of doing some hiring uh, for, for a couple of our programs. So right now um, you have most of our staff here with Mike, Cecilia and I, with the exception of Lauren and Carla. So, all right. So what is assistive technology? Um, that's a good place to start. You have an understanding of what that means in regards to the programs and services we offer. So this is the federal definition of assistive technology. So it's, it's really simply any item, piece of equipment that enhances the capabilities of a person with a disability. So common things we see every day, eyeglasses, uh, the walkers that we have here, wheelchairs, uh, are all forms of assistive technology. Those are the common things we know about. So the kinds of assistive technology that we have today are maybe less common things that you're not as exposed to in the community, like the OB mechanized feeding system that, that we're gonna take a look at today, or some of the speech generating devices for folks that have verbal communication challenges, or some of the adaptive computer access equipment, the less kind of common forms of assistive technology. All right, so in assistive technology overall enhances participation in work, school, and just daily life for persons with disabilities. Uh, it enhances and enables task completion, being able to, to do what they wanna do on a daily basis. It can be things that you buy, that you um, put together, or maybe things you make yourself out of just simple materials in the home if you, if you need a simple tool to be able to do something. So it can be low, mid, or high tech. Some of the items we have here, like some of the weighted silverware, is low tech, very simple, very straightforward. Um, mid tech, uh, like the steady hand uh, spoon, which is the gyroscopic uh, trimmer uh, spoon, is considered mid tech. It has, it has uh, a, a power source and it runs on rechargeable batteries. So it's kind of a mid-level technology. And then high tech equipment, I generally just define if it has a tech support number, it's generally a high tech device. So if you need to call someone for help with it. And then some of our speech generating devices and certainly our adaptive computer access equipment like our head mouse um, uh, fall into the range of high tech assistive technology. So assistive technology can literally encompass thousands of different items across the broad range uh, of disabilities. And we at ASTAP deal with, with if not all, virtually all of them. So um, every day. Yes. Probably do that great. I'm not seeing it. It's at the bottom of your screen. I brought some up, but it is. I did. It says share screen. Those are my two Zoom windows. Oh, pick your pick. It's showing you your PowerPoint that's displaying on your computer. There we go. You got it. Okay. Now I got to get it back on my end. Oh, 
Okay, I'll just do it this way. Yeah. It's not. Okay, guys, you want to work on this? I'm going to keep going. So, oops. Okay. Fortunately, I have a print copy. So, all right. So, it can literally encompass thousands of different kinds of assistive technology. Um, and like I said, we at ASTAP, have to deal with all the different kinds of assistive technology for all the different uh, ranges of disabilities out there. So, um, so some categories of, of assistive technology that, that we cover at ASTAP um, uh, really run the gamut. Uh, we cover uh, assistive technologies for individuals with blindness and low vision, uh, deaf and hard of hearing uh, challenges, uh, recreation, daily living, adaptive computer access, um, learning cognitive and developmental challenges, communication, and mobility and transportation. And at any given time, we uh, have over 36, 3,700 different devices in our inventory. And these are just a few of them here for, for people to access and try. So broad range of different of the types of adaptive equipment available. So having said that, what is our mission and our driving statement? What do all our programs and services try to do? And very simply, we try to connect people with disabilities with assistive technology that will allow them to participate in whatever activities are meaningful to them. So whether that's work or school, daily life, recreation, um, we will try to work with them to find the assistive technology that will allow them to do what it is that's meaningful to them. So our tagline, our advertising tagline is supporting independence with assistive technology. So that's what we try to do on a daily basis. So not there. Okay, that one more. Okay, okay, thanks, Mike. Okay, so we're back on track. So, so what kind of direct service programs does ASTAP have? What do we do? And I'm going to kind of start um, with our oldest program or one of our oldest programs and kind of work my way kind of to present to some of our newer programs. All right. What do we do every day with, uh, with the persons that we serve? Okay, so uh, the first two programs that I'm going to talk about is assistive technology device demonstration and equipment loan or assistive technology device loan. There's, there's, there's two facets to this, demonstration and loans. A demonstration um, is really a guided hands-on exploration of a piece of assistive technology. Gives a person a chance to try it out. Like if you were interested in the OB mechanized feeding system, you'd actually have a chance to try it out and see how it works, see what it does, and to hopefully see if you thought it would work for you or not. So. Um, comparing and contrasting different types of assistive technology with each other. An equipment loan, on the other hand, is just what it sounds like, an opportunity to borrow it and take it wherever it is that you want to use it and try it out. So if you want to try the handheld video magnifier in the store to help you read labels, uh, you can borrow it and take it to the store and try it out. So we actually lend it to you for a couple of weeks and give you a chance to do that. So both of these programs, the main goal is to assist individuals with making the best possible decision about a piece of assistive technology in the hopes they won't pursue and buy something or get a third party funding source to buy something for them that isn't going to work, that they have some, some opportunity to try some things out to make the best decision possible. Our entire inventory is available on our website at any point in time for people to go see what we have in inventory, or if there's a specific device you're looking for, you can go do a search there. So, all right, so for lending, uh, we can lend for four basic reasons. Obviously one is the decision-making process, the opportunity to try something out. We can also lend as an accommodation. Every once in a while, we'll get a call from somebody that needs a piece of equipment. They have a visiting relative. You know, they need a travel ramp for the front door, et cetera we can lend them that piece of equipment as an accommodation. Uh, Short-term loaner, sometimes a person's speech communication device might be in the shop for repairs and they'll borrow ours uh, while theirs is being repaired. So uh, we can lend for uh, a loaner purposes or for training and professional development. So if a therapist wants to borrow, let's say a communication device, 
to learn it a little bit before they work with their client on their device, they can borrow ours to kind of get that hands-on time before they sit down with a person so they don't burn through a lot of therapy time trying to figure out how to use the device that they can hit the ground running with them. So uh, some basic facts about the loan program. We lend, uh, like I said, for two weeks. Uh, we try to make it really barrier free. We have a, a simple loan form that we ask folks to sign, uh, just basically accepting responsibility for the equipment. Uh, we serve all of Arizona. Uh, we ship our loan equipment by FedEx. And we pay for shipping both ways. Uh, so it makes it very easy for folks to get equipment and to get it back to us when they have all the packing materials and the FedEx return label and everything they need to call and schedule a pickup when they're done with the equipment. So our assistive technology lab is open to therapists uh, who want to use it to work with clients um, on assistive technology. And uh, all of our equipment demonstration and loan services are free. There's no charges uh, to anybody to access and use the program. So some basic facts about the demonstration program is Obviously, we don't have every kind of, of assistive technology that's commercially available or available. Uh, we just don't have budget for that or inventory space to be able to manage all that inventory. But more than likely, I'll bet you we have something pretty closer in the family class of what you're interested in. So if you're wanting to trial different head pointing systems to control your mouse instead of having to worry about your hands to control the mouse, we have about a half dozen of those systems. So more than likely, I can show you something that's going to give you the concept of how that technology works. And if there's something more specific that you're wanting, uh, we can either see about getting that system or, you know, adding it to our inventory. But more than likely, we can find something that's pretty close to what you're interested in. Uh, we have a, a, a good track record of being able to get demo devices uh, from manufacturers if it's a really unique piece of equipment that, that somebody wants. So, and we can always research and explore other options. Uh, with you if we do not have something in inventory that's that's a good fit for you. But we have a pretty broad range of, of choice across the continuum. So any questions thus far about our uh, demo and loan programs? Yeah. If you are here in Arizona, uh, you can access and use our program. The only requirement is that you physically be here in Arizona for at least the length of time you'd be working with us. So yeah, um, if you're going back to another state, then we would start with you here and then we would refer you to your other state's program. If that was Minnesota, then it would be Minnesota's program, wherever. So yeah, excellent question. Any others? Our main office is in Phoenix, but if you want to borrow a piece of equipment, uh, we can handle the, the request online and uh, the, the signature on the bar agreement can be done electronically. And then we ship by FedEx. So it shows up at your doorstep, wherever that is in the state of Arizona. So, and then we can work with you one-on-one -on -one over the phone or virtually to use it. Or, you know, if you're working with a therapist who can support you or another family member. So then we can offer those natural supports if needed. Excellent questions. Any others? Yes. We're pretty good. I've been doing this for a lot of years. In fact, most of us have been doing this for a lot of years. So we, we understand functional limitations of, uh, and challenges of, of most major conditions like Parkinson's and other things that, that we come across fairly routinely. So we, we, we do a pretty good job of understanding, yeah. Sometimes, though, uh, we do need to see it, but more or less, we do. We can we can get a sense of it. Yep. Uh, generally, the, the question was uh, working with neurologists. Uh, generally, um, uh, the, w usually it's the therapist. Um, we don't get too many referrals from neurologists. Sometimes for adaptive driving. Uh, but generally, it's the person contacting us or the family contacting us directly based on the recommendation of the therapist or the neurologist, yeah. So, but being a public service program, anybody can refer to us. There's, there's, there's no referral requirements. Anybody can contact us for any information and get the same services. So it doesn't, it's not that important. So, yeah. Okay, good questions, good questions. All right. So. 
I'm gonna jump on and talk about our assistive technology reuse services. And essentially these are ways to get pre-owned or used assistive technology that's maybe not being used uh, back into the hands of someone that could use it. Uh, most folks are familiar with getting medical equipment that maybe their needs change and they don't need anymore. Uh, so it ends up sitting in the garage or it ends up sitting in the closet, uh, you know, not being used. Um, uh, we've, we've probably all seen that or experienced with either ourselves or, or family members or something like that. So the goal of our reuse services is to help give folks a medium or a conduit to get that equipment to somebody else that could benefit from it, whether it's through our AT exchange site, uh, which I'm going to talk a, a little bit now, or to a, a durable medical equipment loan closet, uh, which uh, exists throughout the state of Arizona in lots of different places. So uh, the first reuse program I'm going to tell you about is our AT exchange site. And essentially, this, this is a good site to use um, if you have equipment that you just kind of want to put out uh, for, for in the public for either sale or donation. And it's useful you know, lots of times with the assistive technology, when it wasn't wanted to begin with, uh, the user wasn't involved in the decision-making process, um, doesn't fit the needs any longer, it doesn't do what it was desired, it was inappropriate when it was provided, which uh, happens every once in a while. Um, both of these uh, of our sites that I'm going to tell you about give folks an opportunity to get that technology that maybe fit into one of these categories um, back out into usage. So, um, all right. So the first one is the Arizona Assistive Technology Exchange. It works more or less kind of like a Craigslist or a forum, kind of a one ads forum uh, for persons to advertise post equipment, either if they're looking for an item or if they have equipment they want to uh, sell or donate or exchange. So uh, pretty straightforward site to use. Um, of course, free to use, there's no charges. Uh, you can set the system to email you if you're um, interested in a specific item in a category or by a keyword. Uh, you can set it uh, to email you when, when an ad goes in meeting those parameters. Uh, at any given time, we have you know, 50 or 60 ads up there for all kinds of different assistive technology devices throughout the state. Um, the site is supported every day. So ads are going off, ads are going up as people post items. So it's kept up to date and, and um, is, is always current um, as we can have it be uh, for what's available. So the site is just for consumers to use um, and it's not for vendors at this point uh, to sell assistive technology. So it's just for private consumers and rehab professionals to be able to give folks a medium to find out about used assistive technology. So yeah, question. It, uh, that's gonna be at the end. I'm gonna give you all of that. So hold that thought. Um, you'll get all the easy access URLs at, at the end. So, yeah, so, uh, all right. So switching gears from that, um, we can, uh, of course, offer assistance over the phone with placing ads if a computer doesn't have, or computer, excuse me, if a person doesn't have a computer or internet access, we can assist them over the phone. Um, if a person does have access to all that, they can go and use the site completely independent of us. We do have a, a staff member that helps folks manage and use that site. So, all right. So switching gears from that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, our other website called the Reuse Coalition. And essentially what this is, we developed this uh, probably about 12 years ago, give or take a little bit, um, 11 years ago. And essentially this is a comprehensive listing of medical equipment, loan closets and reuse closets throughout the state. And right now we have 47 programs. I didn't count this morning, but I think, we have, I think we have 47 on there now, which is a fair amount of programs throughout the state that deal in used medical equipment in some capacity. So uh, this site is always an ongoing development for us. As we find out about new programs, we try to get them up. As programs close down, we take them off, et cetera. So it's always kind of in a state of flow. Um, and the, the, the main goal is to give folks a good way to find out about those programs. Uh, far too often in my, in my history as a rehab counselor, someone would discharge from, from the hospital and the therapist, well-meaning, would just give them a list of like 25 different loan closets and say, here, start calling to find the transfer bench or the walker or the folding wheelchair that you need. And that's a lot of programs to cover. 
and folks would start calling and a lot of them, they may not meet the eligibility criteria for, they you know, may not serve their zip code or their type of disability uh, or be too far away to get the, uh, the item. So what our goal was, was to make a comprehensive listing of all those programs that is searchable by criteria, eligibility, zip code, and what you need. So it'll help narrow down that search. So someone goes on our site looking for a manual wheelchair, manual folding wheelchair for the car because they can't take the power chair right now because they can't get it in the car. So they can go in, enter their zip code that they need a manual folding wheelchair, and then it will bring up the programs that serve that zip code and state that they generally have manu manual folding wheelchairs in their inventory. So it may narrow it from 25 programs to five. That's a lot easier list to call and hopefully more targeted um, for, for folks to be able to get the equipment they need. They can review the eligibility criteria for the program uh, once they're there and then get the contact information. So they can get all the information before they kind of end up uh, to try to make the decision that it's the best fit possible. Conversely, let's say you have a lot of equipment that you just want to donate. You can go on our site and take a look at places that will accept your equipment. So you can put in, all right, I have a tub transfer bench. Who accepts those in my area? You can put that in. I want to donate something. And it will bring up the list of those programs that, that tell you that they'll accept that kind of equipment. And then you can make a decision on the, the program you want to support or the mission you want to support or the one that's closest to your home, whatever that may be. So it helps you get assistive technology, medical equipment. It helps you find a home for it on the, on the flip side. So comprehensive listing, uh, the site works really well. Um, and I'd encourage you to take a look at, at both of those uh, programs on our website. And like I said, at the end, you're gonna get um, an overview of our, our website and I'll tell you where they're all at. So they're easy to find. All right, so finally, our last reuse service that we technically do, uh, we partnered with Achieve Human Services in Yuma uh, to offer a discount on refurbished computer systems. So often folks do not need a new computer, sometimes for students or maybe seniors, they don't need the latest and the greatest and a refurbished computer can be a great fit um, uh, for that person. So through this program, Anybody can buy from Refurbit. You can go, anybody in the whole world can go and buy a computer, discounted refurbished computer from them. Through our program, we offer a 25% discount to any person with a disability or their family member that receives some type of public assistance benefit. So if that's like social security or maybe access or virtually anything, VA coverage, uh, you can provide proof of that coverage apply for that discount and get 25% off of refurbits already pretty low prices. So um, makes it a little bit more affordable for folks to get that, that tablet PC, that laptop or that desktop computer. And uh, on refurbit site, I mean, there are, there are complete systems in there ranging uh, from 130 to $300, of course, depending on the capability of the computer you get. But I was working with a, with a young lady this morning who was interested in a desktop PC and there was a basic one for $130, a monitor for $30. Uh, so she was right in the ballpark of, of $150, $60 for the complete system. And then, you know, the 25% discount on top of that. So it was going to be a very affordable system for her to get her started in the right direction. It wasn't going to be necessarily what she always have, but um, it was a good place to start for her uh, with, with her computer needs. So a couple of other caveats about these computers, they come with a basic Microsoft Office suite. Uh, I think it's like Word and, and PowerPoint and maybe Outlook. Uh, so it gets you started with those products. And there's a 12 month warranty. Uh, so in case the computer goes bad within the first year, refurbit or achieve will replace it. So a little bit of security on buying a refurbished item, which I know is a concern. So, uh, so that's the basics about our refurbit program. Any questions about, um, any of those reuse services, the AT Exchange site, the Use Coalition, or the Refurbit program. All right, good deal. All right, so um, at ASTAP, we also do tons of information and assistance on just assistive technology across the board. People with disabilities, their family members, rehabilitation providers call us all the time with all kinds of questions about. Um, assistive technology, where they can get things, what'll work for them, 
uh, et cetera. So we do just lots of just basic information and assistance. Some of it's very short term. I might have somebody call and says, hey, I need to rent a wheelchair van for the weekend. Where can I do that? I'll give them three or four different places that'll rent them a wheelchair van. Um, and you know, it might be very complex requests that we get. Sometimes I work with folks for just a few minutes and sometimes I work with them for years. This depends on how complex their request is. So, um, but we do lots of information and assistance just for the community on AT. So some of those are, you know, what'll work for me in my situation? How can I pay for it? Um, is there anything cheaper that, you know, will also work for me? I need to get an evaluation for something. A lot of times that comes with adaptive driving. Lots of folks don't know if you have a change in your medical situation, condition uh, that would potentially affect your ability to drive. You're supposed to report that uh, to the Department of Motor Vehicle. And then there's a process you go through to, to be relicensed with if you need adaptive equipment to drive. So lots of times we can educate folks on that process and help them get connected with those services and programs. Um, and local or national providers of AT. Um, if you're interested in caption phone technology and you go into Best Buy, chances are they're not gonna know a whole lot about it, but if you come to ASTAP, we know a whole lot about caption phone technology and we'll give you the opportunity to try it out. So um, where you can get things uh, locally or nationally as well. So in addition, uh, we do tons of training and technical assistance on virtually every assistive technology topic, trainings like this. John contacted me and said, will you come down and talk to our group about your programs and services and bring some adaptive aids and devices for them to try and see. Here we are. So we do trainings for the community on whatever the request is, uh, small or large. We also offer technical assistance to the community. So that, that's generally for organizations or programs that need help making determinations about assistive technology for their clientele. Uh, we do a lot of work with like, uh, libraries and churches and places like that um, on assistive technology for their uh, constituents uh, or parishioners or whatever they're called um, for, for their program. So th th basically, you know, we provide them whatever support they need to, you know, figure out what's going to work best for the people that they serve. So we've also always got two or three uh, different TA projects. I just finished one up on uh, for a church out in East Mesa that was trying to do um, uh, captioning transcription for its homebound uh, uh, seniors. So we, uh, we got them moving along with that. So, all right. Any questions about our training or um, uh, technical assistance services? We do. So the question was, do we do any design of assistive technology? Not a whole lot. Um, uh, it's kind of a unique skill set. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't. We, we're getting into 3D printing of some different things. We have a couple of 3D printers, and we're investigating getting a laser cutter that would allow us to do a little bit more. So, but we, if we do get a special request, we do know folks in the community that could help us with it. So we would probably refer out for that. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? That was, a, that was a good one. All right. Good deal. All right. So I'm going to talk about our oldest direct service program at ASTAP. Um, I was actually involved with the development of this program in the year 2000 um, when it was first uh, brought on board. I served on the, 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 the uh, development committee for it, more or less. And uh, then I joined ASTAP in 2007, so I've been there 16 years. But I, so I've been involved with this program since, uh, since before I was even with the organization. This is called ASLAT, or Arizona Loans for Assistive Technology. And essentially, this is the state's alternative financing program that allows persons with disabilities and their families to take out low interest, affordable, um, flexible financial loans to buy assistive technology. As you know, uh, not all kinds of, of AT or assistive technology is covered by health insurance or voc rehab or DDD or Medicare or, you know, any of the other various funding sources, the VA, you know, it's not all covered um, by everywhere. Some types of AT is, but um, not all are. So we have this mechanism for folks to be able to borrow funds to, to, to get um, 
uh, assistive technology and borrow it at a very affordable interest rate with flexible lending terms. So uh, what kinds of assistive technology? Really just about anything. Um, a, a common one we do is uh, people will have, Medicare will provide that power chair and maybe the supplemental insurance will pick up the, the copay for that power chair. But folks are surprised that Medicare won't put a lift on your vehicle to transport it into the community. So you can take it to Walmart, you can take it to church, those kinds of places. Well, some of you may know that a lift for the vehicle for that power chair can easily be three or $4,000, depending on what you need to put it on. Well, this is a mechanism for folks to be able to take out a low interest loan and pay it off over time to be able to afford that expensive piece of technology. Other loans we do are for hearing aids. Um, those are not easy to fund. Uh, sometimes people put them on credit cards, which can be very expensive or um, other types of financing. Uh, so hearing aids can easily be four to $6,000. Uh, so we, we offer again, a mechanism for folks to be able to, you know, take out a, a, a low interest loan to be able to afford that, that, that kind of technology. So, so really any type of assistive technology, blindness, low vision aids, recreational equipment, adaptive computer access, uh, adaptive driving uh, equipment and services, et cetera, are all coverable uh, through, through the loan program. So we lend for uh, a wide variety of AT. This summer, uh, we had a young man with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy who used a special type of Clinitron bed, uh, which is a rotating fluidic sand bed to adjust pressure. Well, his home air conditioning unit went out and the, the Clinitron bed has to operate at a certain air temperature within a couple, two or three degrees, or it stops, it doesn't work. The sand turns to a more of a solid than it, need, than it should be. And we were able to fund for his family to install a new air conditioning in, system in the home because the AC system was part of his bed, which is assistive technology and functioning. So we get to do lots of cool things outside the box like that for folks. Um, uh, to, to, to be able to get back on what they need to do. So, all right. So some basic facts, uh, our interest rate is four and a half percent, which uh, which six months ago wasn't that great, but now as interest rates are rising are actually looking pretty good again. When you compare that with a credit card or even an unsecured line of credit, you know, it's gonna be a pretty attractive interest rate um, uh, for most folks. Our loan amounts range from 100 to 20,000. Uh, we can go above 20,000. In fact, I just got a loan application this week for almost $30,000. And we're gonna consider that one on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, $100, under $500, we actually consider those mini loans and we have a streamlined approval process for those. So we can lend a lot of money or a little money. Um, our lending partner is Marisol Federal Credit Union in, in Phoenix. Uh, they actually... Um, our loan review committee makes the decision, but Marisol actually funds the loan, uh, cuts the check to, to the family based on what we determine. So uh, flexible, we can uh, account for credit issues that are maybe related to a disability, losing a job or medical debt or you know, things like that. We're not turning folks down for you know, common things that a bank may, a uh, traditional lending organization. We have a loan review committee that meets monthly to review applications and, and makes decisions. And our next meeting is next Tuesday. So, all right. So some basic uh, uh, requirements. We ask that folks be a resident of Arizona and lawfully here in the United States. Uh, it's a very empowering program because you don't want to wait for anybody. You can pick what you need, apply to get a loan for it and get it. Um, we ask that folks uh, demonstrate some basic credit worthiness and at least sufficient monthly income at the end of the month to be able to make the loan payment uh, that they're wanting. Like I said, we have adjustable, uh, flexible terms. We can go 12 to 60 months on, on loan terms. We really kind of counsel with folks and caution them not to get upside down in equipment. So like with hearing aids that really have a functional life of about three years, um, we really encourage folks not to do a four or, or five year loan on a pair of hearing aids. Uh, we don't want to see people get upside down in something so um, that uh, it, they're going to pay for after its useful life. And it's an underutilized program right now, give or take. Uh, we have about a million six, million five on deposit with the Arizona Community Foundation that we use to guarantee the loan program for Marisol. So um, all of that funding backs up the loan program and we lend against it. So, um, and we're always looking for new loan applications. So we don't, we don't get as many as we'd like. So as I've mentioned, um, 
First off, any questions about our ASLAP program, about the alternative financing program? Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we also have an adaptive video gaming clinic that we launched in July, It's a part-time program for us. So individuals with disabilities that um, have difficulty playing video games, we work with them on uh, adaptive equipment and software settings and game settings and console settings to help them be able to better game. We're actually doing some 3D printing on, on controller adaptations and things like that. Uh, so we hired a clinical coordinator part-time to, to run that program. Um, we um, have two Doctor of Occupational Therapy capstone students starting on Monday that are gonna help us run that program for four months. So um, we're real excited about that. Uh, so, and we have a whole page on our website dedicated to that. So um, persons with uh, video gaming goals can certainly access that program. All right, so any questions about any part of my presentation thus far? Okay, let's jump into the assistive technology. These are the categories of devices we brought. These are the main categories that folks present to us with challenges in. Um, I could put daily living up here, but surprisingly, we get few requests for it. We get a few, but these are the main ones. Mobility, speech communication, eating, computer access, cell phone access, and writing. Those are the biggest ones that, that folks with Parkinson's and related uh, neurological conditions come to us uh, looking for assistance with. So I'm gonna run through, these are the devices that we brought today. Everything in my PowerPoint is out here on a table. Uh, so if there's something that picks your interest, when we get to the equipment end, you can work with uh, Mike, Cecilia, or I on it. Um, we had a special request from Charlene to bring mobility equipment, uh, specifically the U-Step, uh, which is um, a specialized walker. In the community, you'll know it or you'll hear it referred to as a reverse walker because of the way that you use it. Usually on a regular rollator style walker, when you pull up on the handbrakes, it stops. But with a reverse walker, when you pull up on the handbrakes, it goes. So um, it's known as a reverse walker in the community. And there's a couple, two or three. The U-Step is probably one of the most popular or the most known out there um, of the reverse walkers. It also comes with the popular feature of the laser and the metronome to help uh, unblock the freezing that's, that's, um, that's common sometimes in Parkinson's and mobility. So it's a popular device. Uh, we work with the, the um, uh, movement disorder clinic at Barrows a lot, and they send people over to borrow our U-Step for a couple of weeks to try it out. So, um, uh, and this one's brand new. We actually have two now. We have an older one and this one's brand new. We just got it last month. So uh, the next device we have, is called the Next Stride. And essentially this is the same thing as a U-Step, but it allows you to attach um, the laser guide and the metronome sound cue to any mobility device, uh, your own regular rollator, uh, another rigid frame walker, a straight cane, whatever other mobility device you're using, you can attach it to it. U-Step is an integrated, it's its own walker, but the next stride allows you to take those laser cue and the sound and put them on um, uh, your own device. So it's, it adapts whatever you have. So a little bit different uh, um, uh, uh, type of device, but similar. All right, so um, speech communication. Um, we brought the Light Rider SL50, which is a speech generating device. It produces an auditory output based on keyboard entry for folks that maybe have verbal communication challenges. They might have a very weak voice because of Parkinson's. They might have a very rapid voice because of Parkinson's. So however the speech presentation is, they may need some type of communication aid to help kind of help them be understood with unfamiliar listeners. So the SL50 is a popular one uh, that we see a lot of interest in. Um, the Advox 7, the voice amplifier, we have a whole broad range of voice amplifiers, but these are for folks with very soft speech. Um, maybe they're difficult to hear because they're just breathy or whispery speech. A voice amplifier uh, can help the person be a little bit louder and heard a little bit better. So again, it's a very popular device. And then we brought um, what's called a dynamic display communication device, which is essentially a touchscreen 
that allows a person to access a vocabulary off of the touch screen. So, and we have all of these here to try. Um, the dynamic display device gives you multiple access options. So if you're not able to touch the screen, you can control it with head pointing or uh, with what's called switch scanning. There's some different access methods uh, if, if touching it with your fingers just isn't gonna work anymore. All right, so eating, probably the biggest Parkinson's related request we get, um, no surprise. So uh, I mentioned a couple times today, the OB mechanized feeding system, which essentially takes the, the hands and arms out of the eating equation and by switch control, it selects food and will deliver it uh, up to where you can take it off the spoon. So um, mechanized feeding system. And we have probably four or five different mechanized feeding systems, but the OB is the popular one. Uh, we also have the Liftware Steady uh, gyroscopic utensils, which has a gyroscope in it that counters the trimmer for Parkinson's. Uh, so when the trimmer moves one way, the gyroscopic uh, spoon moves the other and back and forth and back and forth. So the, the whole goal is, is countering that trimmer that is supposed to factor it out and help the food stay on the spoon um, and make it to your mouth. So uh, we have the stable slide, which is a, um, a hand slide. Uh, you can see the young lady uh, that helps support the, the, the spoon all the way from the, from the plate or bowl all the way up to the mouth. Gives you something to rest against to help uh, take that trimmer out of equation. We have the meal lifter, uh, which is uh, basically, the, the basic concept is the, the less distance you have to go, the less chance the trimmer can <laughs> knock, the, knock the food off the spoon. So the meal lifter just lifts your plate up about six inches and makes it a little bit um, easier. So you're not, because most folks, if they're eating off the table, they're down like this, you know, trying to limit that distance. So the, the meal lifter makes it so you don't have to lend, lean over so far. So um, we just got the Panini Eatsy hands-free eating device. Uh, which takes a little bit of explanation, but um, essentially as set up, uh, you put the food and you control it with the movement of your head. Go ahead and point to it, Mike. So, and you would move it with your chin and then take bites off of it. So you don't have to use your arms. You just eat and then move it around um, uh, with your chin. So it might be easier if you sit down. So that's the hot dog holder. And, and you put that on top and then move move it around with your chin. So, so that one you might have to try to get the concept of how it works. Um, of course, and then we have a whole broad range of specialized utensils, swivel, weighted, light and easy, um, easy grasp, uh, easy to pick up. Um, we have weighted and two-handled cups and mugs, which is another popular option. And we have some lockdown plates that helps keep the plate in place, uh, some scooper plates, suction cup plates and bowls, Etc. So, um, just some basic of the more common things that you know folks are going to be you know told about in rehab that you know maybe they've tried, maybe they haven't, um, but that are you know part of at least the beginning exploration of AT for, for Parkinson's. So, uh, for computer access, uh, we also have um, uh, we have the Steady Mouse software, uh, which is essentially a downloadable software for PC that um, runs in the background and lets you do adjustment settings to control the, the movement of the mouse. So it helps cancel out the trimmer. So while your trimmers may be moving your mouse like this, if you have it on the right setting on the, on the mouse, um, steady mouse software, it will factor and take that trimmer out so the mouse pointer will stay still based on wherever you're going on the screen. So your trimmer is still going on, but the mouse pointer staying still makes it easier to target uh, where you're where you're going. So um, pretty functional software works pretty well. Uh, we also have the AMA Neo, which is the anti-trimmer mouse adapter, which is a USB plug-in for a regular wireless or USB mouse. And again, like the Steady Mouse software, helps take that trimmer out and put some settings and adjustments to help factor that trimmer out of uh, the mouse pointing. Uh, we also have brought a computer with Windows 10 accessibility settings. Uh, slow keys, repeat keys, bounce keys, mouse keys, and sticky keys. Micah is going to give you an overview of all these if you have an interest in them. Essentially, these are all settings that are existing in your computers right now that you can go in that will help you use the mouse or the keyboard. Um, so, you know, if you have difficulty, you know, getting off the, the, the T, 
back off of it and you get a whole row of T's, there's a setting to adjust for that. Or if you, if you hit one T too many times and you get two keys because you can't stop hitting it, you can filter that and change it so it'll only accept one T, not repeated ones. Mouse keys gives you the ability to use your number pad on a regular USB keyboard to control your mouse. Lots of folks don't know that. You can control your mouse with your keyboard. That might work a lot better than a regular mouse. So, uh, so and sticky keys allows you, maybe you only have one of your hands is better for typing. The other one's not as good. If you have to hit control, alt, delete, you can't do that with one hand. I mean, the fingers aren't that long. So sticky keys allows you to hit control, alt, and delete separately and get the same function as hitting them all at the same time. So there's some settings that are just embedded in your system that you might be able to make use of. They're free, they're there. So it's just a matter of turning them on and knowing how to use them. We also brought some keyboards with key guards. Key guards are an overlooked option for folks a lot of times. And essentially a key guard is just a plastic overlay for the keyboard that allows you to rest your hand on the keyboard without pressing any key. And then you can put your finger down into where you want. Now you're not gonna touch type with a key guard. But if you just got to do a little bit of typing or data entry, a keyboard can help you do it and help improve your, your accuracy. So, and we brought three different kinds of keyboards, a regular size, the Moore keyboard, which is a three quarter inch size key and the Chester Creek uh, keyboard, which is a one inch size key. So uh, bigger key keyboards. And finally, we have the Head Mouse Nano uh, with Dwell Clicker 2 software. And essentially this is a head pointing system where you control the mouse with the movement of your head. And then it uses an on-screen software to um, do all the mouse operations. So you don't have to worry about clicking anymore. You can control left click, right click, drag and drop, double left click, all by the on-screen software. So all you have to do is point at what you want and it does it. So you can take that mouse out of that hardware mouse or, or touch pad on a laptop out of the equation. So. And lots of folks with Parkinson's, generally their head control is pretty good. So, you know, wherever you look is where the mouse pointer goes on the screen. That's simple. So, all right. Um, Mike's gonna work with you a little bit if you'd like on, for cell phone, on, um, uh, for iPhone, for access and control of it. Cell phones get a little bit tough because real estate's small. You got a little screen. You generally got a touch screen and you got to touch it. Now there's alternative ways to access a cell phone, but they're a little bit more challenging. So the main way that we usually um, get to with folks with Parkinson's is by voice control. So with voice control in iOS, you can go in and navigate your phone by voice command. So you can move and select things um, by, by, by telling it what you wanna do. So take some effort to learn the commands and learn how to do it, but it is completely controllable by voice. So if your phone's setting in front of you or stabilized and you can see it, you can gain that control back. Uh, Siri commands, a lot of folks don't completely understand all you can do with Siri. Um, you can uh, make a call on speakerphone by voice. Uh, you can send a text message by voice with Siri and read text messages by voice with Siri. You can set reminders, you can check your voicemail and you can send check and read email with Siri too, all by voice command. So some folks just, you know, know a little bit about, you know, where's the closest pizza hut or something like that. And, you know, that's as far as they get with Siri. What we will try to work with you to do is understand the broader range of that access so that you can use that as a control mechanism to do what it is you want to do with your cell phone. And finally, touch accommodations. There are some settings with an iPhone where you can go in and change how the screen responds to your touch. So depending on your level of tremor or you know, access on the screen challenges, um, there might be some touch accommodation settings that will help you improve your access. So again, if you've got an iPhone, they're there, they're free. It's just a matter of going in and setting, up, setting them up and making use of them. So um, we have our iPhone to, to be able to, to, to work with you on. And finally, uh, writing. So, um, writing's challenge, uh, usually the, the best option for it is weighted uh, type uh, utensils or um, aids. Uh, so we have a handwriting glove at a half pound. Uh, we have some uh, wrist weight sets of different um, uh, weights, uh, one to two and a half pounds. Uh, heavyweight pen, which is a weighted pen. And uh, we have a forearm weight. Sometimes the weight 
is more helpful being in the forearm than on the hand, depending. And then we have a hold down magnetic writing aid, which essentially attaches a magnet to your wrist and you have a sheet of paper on a sheet of metal and the magnet holds your wrist in place as you write. So, and there's different thicknesses depending on how much your trimmer is and how strong the magnet is against the metal. So very simple technology, but very useful for some folks. So, um, so we have those aids for writing. All right, so uh, I always like to cover a little bit about basic assistive technology considerations before we get into devices too much. Um, just keep the following in mind. And we try to practice this every day with, um, uh, with the folks we work with. We try to keep everything functional task-based. So what is it that the person wants to do, needs to do? We focus on that individual task. Um, basically, people may need different kinds of assistive technology in different environments. Um, communication needs, for instance, for someone at home with you know, Parkinson's might be different at home than at school or at work or something like that. So they may be different types of assistive technology for different environments. So we really try to focus on the functional tasks they need to do uh, exactly. It's all about the features of the device. Sometimes devices have a lot more features than the person needs or wants to use. So they don't need it. You know, think about that iPad you got. It does an awful lot. Maybe you don't need something that sophisticated and you need something simpler. Well, that's, that's what we try to focus on is get the features that you need um, that, to try to keep it as simple as possible. Assistive technology is very individualized. Uh, I can see two persons with Parkinson's and they need completely different kinds of assistive technology depending on you know, what their functional task needs are and what features they want. So you know, no two people are the same. So very individualized. Uh, simplest is usually the best option. The simpler something can be, the more likely it's gonna be work, the more affordable it's gonna be generally, et cetera. So we try to keep it as simple as possible. Always we want to involve the user in the decision-making process. We see lots of times, you know, uh, kids will bring their parents in and set them down and say, okay, mom's having problems reading the newspaper because of her vision loss. And okay, mom. So we start talking about that. And I find out she's got a whole other set of concerns. She's not too concerned about the paper. She's more concerned about a, 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 a magazine of some sort or something. That is a completely different type of, of aid to read. So, um, so we try to really involve the users so we get their input because nobody likes having decisions made for them. So um, we try to involve the user in the decision-making process as often as we can. Try it before you buy it. You know, hopefully most folks won't buy a new car without test driving it. I guess some folks may, but you know, with us, we give you an opportunity to try something out before you buy it to make sure it's gonna do what, what you wanna do. So you, know, you can think of us as your opportunity to try before you buy some type of assistive technology. And you know we can often give you options uh, or suggestions on other options uh, so that you're just not narrow. May have heard of one thing on TV, but you know maybe there are other choices that might be a better fit. And that's where we come in to give you that, to, that information so, or that education. So, all right. So let's go ahead and jump into the devices. Any questions about what I said about AT selection or any of the devices before we jump into them? None? Okay. Nope. We ship them. Yeah. I mean, ideally, if you're in Phoenix for a medical appointment and want to schedule to come in and see us, that's fine. You know, it's it's just, you know, easier to, 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 to work with us in person, um, but we can ship equipment and work with you virtually. If you, the situation requires it, we can travel to where the person is. Of course, we don't do that as the first choice just because the time and the expense of doing that trip. But if someone requires us to come because they're not able to travel or the assistive technology is just not shippable. Uh, a good example would be the U-STEP, we're just not able to ship it. Um, so we would have to work out a, a way to get that. And we've done that to, to get it around the state. So whoever wants it. So sometimes it takes a little bit of creative work, but we figure out a way to do it. So um, yeah, so no, it's uh, either in our office or uh, through, uh, through shipping or uh, we come to you. Yeah. Other questions? 
Okay, let's jump into the equipment. Mike Cecilia. 